。好，那离今天整个活动的结束时间大概还有一个钟头左右啊。呃，今天整天下来，大家应该受益良多，听到了非常非常多。特别是像刚刚他们把整个 simulation theory trail 里头呃解构，然后我也是第一次在一个演讲当中听到那么多呃大量使用即时追踪传动技术，像 Black Tracks 或 Notch 啊、呃，用在演唱会里头很很实际的例子哦，然后知道他们怎么运作的。呃，当然我们要再一次这个呃介绍一下今天现场的三位来宾啊、哦，因为。他要分享很多，呃，他们自己独特的、独特的见解跟看法来跟我们分享。我们再次热烈掌声欢迎 Jesse、Sooner， 还有张大山、罗罗胜俊先生。OK， 那其实刚刚没有办法马上开 Q&A 哦。那这个呃，罗胜俊先生已经说他可以自肥嘛，他可以先先先上来就问问题嘛，哈，所以我就做个球给他。这个呃，已经是为人师，但是还是很喜欢。发问的学生，来罗同学，你要问什么呢？嗯、呃，好，我我觉得我们还是要先感谢一下，就是 Jesse 跟 Sooner， 就是我觉得能把一个演唱会 break down 到这么仔细，给就是现场每个人，我觉得这是非常难得，谢谢他们。Thank you so much. Thank you. So I have three questions. <laughs> so basically, uh, what's your first uh concert project, and what's the challenge? What's like anything fucked up during the concert? Yeah, that's first question. And I have three questions. So the the second one. Two more. Uh, how do you come out the story? Like break down the concert. How do you come out that? And it's like most creative director or lighting director doing the same way, or it's only you are different. And third question will be what's essential to become the creative director and lighting director. In music, uh, in music concert industry, that's a lot. But here, here you go. All right. So the the first thing we worked on, I guess, uh, well, I covered the uh, Rihanna piece in the beginning. Um, that for some reason, uh, a bunch of noisy, um, evil-looking video distortion uh, attracted Rihanna's creative team. But the the first project with uh, Sooner and I together, my, we might have cheated. There there was a little bit of a there was a Jay Z South by Southwest thing that we kind of crossed paths with. That was we didn't talk much on that project because the studio I was at、uh, got the call from Jay Z eight days before the first show. So I think we were up twenty four hours a day for. No, it was just、uh, his a singular performance by him. He did. It、yeah. was like a special performance he did or something. Yeah, it was some like club. Only for people with American Express credit cards. Could go. It was like it was crazy. <laughs> But, But、uh, yeah, I think that you, you worked on that a bit and yeah. Yeah, I did the lighting design for that one. Kind of cross paths、mm -hmm. quickly and. Yeah, geez, that was rough. We、um, didn't sleep, so we didn't talk to anybody、no. except for、uh, yeah. Yeah,、uh, Jay himself came in like thirty minutes before. The doors opened to like give us our comment, his comments, and both of us were like, "Okay, we don't even have <laughs> time to <laughs> fix this." Or it wasn't much fixing. He actually loved the majority of it, but there were some notes, and we're like, "I have never seen somebody work、uh, as quickly as he did." So yeah, as she was saying, thirty minutes before door, Jay Z comes in the first time he had seen anything of this show, and、uh, he watches the lighting and the video content, and he's like, "Okay, great." Great. Okay, change this video content to this song. Okay, move this video content to that song. Change the color of that to this, and then okay, let's do the show. <laughs> yeah, I choose to try to forget those days, so we should probably move on <laughs> from this. What was question two? <laughs> oh yeah. Well, so the first concert I ever was a lighting designer on was for a little rock band named Chevelle out of Chicago.、Um, and yeah, we worked on the Jay Z, the Weekend stuff together. It's the first concert you ever saw. First concert I ever saw. Yeah. Oh wow.、Um, oh, the first one I went to、oh, was <laughs> this small、uh, grunge band called the Melvins. They influenced、uh, Nirvana, and I think I was 13 when I saw that.、Um, it was around that or Smashing Pumpkins.、Yeah. So my first concert ever that I saw was Smashing Pumpkins, Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness tour, and I was. Seventeen years old, maybe, 
And it that was where I found, that's where I decided I knew what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I saw that lighting designer, Lawrence Upton, and I saw the way he used light and like how the colors and the movement and what it did to my like viewing experience and listening experience to a concert. And I went home telling my parents I wanted to be a roadie and they lost their minds on me. I think the first show that I saw that made me conscious of uh, stage design and show design was Nine Inch Nails, the Downward Spiral Tour. That was maybe 95. And I remember they had a projection screen in front of Trent Reznor, so it was hiding him. But you could slightly see him uh, through the screen with a spotlight on him. And there was all this footage of, it was time lapse of decaying animals that were dead and maggots were eating it. And uh, it just yeah, it blew me away. Sorry, what was question two again? <laughs> Uh, like, let's jump to the third question. Oh. Uh, how do you... We take too long. Yeah. We like to you talk. You take two and another question. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, how do you, uh, how to become a creative director and lighting director in this industry? Well, I think, yeah, everybody's path is uh, different. For mine, uh, it's generally been that uh, I can't keep my mouth shut and I give an opinion on everything. So... Uh, in a way of, you know, I was working in video content and said, oh, well, you know, I wish the lights were doing this. Um, or, yeah, if we, you know, turn the video off here and the lights on here and then the lights off and then the video on here, it's kind of playing back and forth. Um, I think it would create some dynamics. And uh, so then my mentor boss, uh, Willow Perone, uh, gave me a great opportunity of uh, starting to take a larger role in some jobs and it, it started to, to snowball and you know different things as I mentioned earlier uh, people would come up and say oh Jesse you could probably do this right and I just say uh, yeah of course I can and <laughs> <laughs> knowing well enough that uh, I can figure it out and I do a lot of research and uh, yeah I think that's part of the trick is just always being hungry to do more and to, to pay attention to all the little details in the show and what you would do differently or what you think is working well um, that you can take with you. And um, yeah, to not be afraid to, to speak up and get involved. I think that's, that's how uh, Muse brought me on to a larger role when I was just doing content and interactive for them. I was always a part of the conversation, giving input on other things and they found that valuable. Uh, I took a very different approach to getting into the business. Um, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to be in the concert space as a lighting person. Um, but I had always, when I was lighting dance through in high school, when I was lighting theater in high school, I always, I was never really just thinking about the lighting. I, I was always thinking about everything else and how all of the elements of a show interact with one another. Um, and then I saw that first concert told my parents what I was going to do. And I think after a lot of hounding, they were like, just go to school for it, and maybe it'll get out of your system. Um, but it didn't. I found my first job with a production company, and I was literally just fixing building lighting rigs in a warehouse, uh, pushing road cases, um, climbing trusses to focus lights. I was, I was the technical person on... Uh, a lot of shows in the Boston area and through that I just got my first tour and I just kept pushing like okay I don't want to just do lighting I want to design full shows so every time I got the opportunity to build a set piece for an artist I would do so and then have it interact with lighting in a way that they'd be like okay well this still falls under your realm so it just grew my career that way. That's a great point and I think I also get I get bored really easily and uh, once, I mean, I, I won't say that I'm a master at anything. I just get bored quickly and when I, I sort of, I hit a plateau. And so I always want to add in more like, oh, let's bring in dancers now or like let's bring in interactivity or try something else. And so um, that after designing a few shows, that's why when Muse called about uh, directing simulation theory, I said only if I can do, oversee everything in of this album cycle because I, I just... I get bored and I want to get bigger and bigger. So I, I kind of don't know what's next. 
听起来就是呃，他们都遇到很有想法的这个合作对象，可以激荡出这么多的故事出来。那下面这一题，我觉得他们三个都可以来答了哦。那如果你遇到的是歌手或唱片公司或经纪公司或这个团队是都没有想法的，那你们是怎么样继续做下去的？我觉得罗生进同学，你好像也可以回答这一题。其实我觉得在台湾，呃，这样子的，就是产业下面，其实我们看到设计慢慢变成显学。嗯，我觉得这这一题对我来说太常见了，就是人家没有想法，人家没有想法，就代表你要有想法，就这么简单而已。就是你可以提供各个不同角度，就是到底你觉得可以怎么做会更好？呃，到底怎么做可以不一样啊？然后所有的细节，我觉得刚刚有个很大的重点就是，不要害怕问问题，不要害怕去做改变，然后。呃，你们刚刚有看到二马，二马从二十年前就是看到我在东风，就是到处冲撞，每个人都讨厌我，因为我一直在问问题，然后我一直缠着每一个人，就说，哎、欸，到底怎么做可以不一样？我觉得那个是让，呃，你的东西会不一样的一个最大的重点，嗯、就是持续去问问题，持续去提出来不一样的做法，人家没想法，就代表那是你的机会。嗯，那 J C 呢？孙乐呢 ？Are we two? I, I totally agree with you, by the way. Um, Let's question everything. Yes, be annoying. Ask a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if they don't give me even one spark of an idea, I do ask a lot of questions. Or like, have you seen any movies that you like? Or have what, what um, store displays, you know, like, did you go to the latest Louis Vuitton store and see the store display and the, how the things were moving in the window? Like, Stuff like that, just like what appeals to them. Sometimes I actually ask them to make a mood board for me. Like, how about you pull up all the images that you have been inspiring you? Um, I once asked an artist if he were a crayon, what color would he be? And it was telling, like, it, you know, he said, I'd be a bunch of colors. Today I'm blue, but tomorrow I might be red. So it was like, okay, he has other ideas. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that I think that it happens a lot where uh, artists or the team don't know what they want. And I think it depends on how long the artist has had a career. If they've been around for a while, you can sort of see a pattern in their work and understand the trajectory that you think they should be going in, what makes uh, a logical step. And with newer artists, yeah, you've kind of got to get down into understanding them a bit more. It's very crucial to spend time with the artists themselves to understand them because it's their music that has given you a job. So they have something inside of them which maybe they don't know uh, what it is yet that can create a brand or uh, some sort of visual aesthetic, but it's in there and it's into us to, uh, it's up to us to, to highlight that, to bring a spotlight to it. And it's through uh, asking questions and getting to understand them a bit more so that when we create something for the artists, uh, it is true to them. Uh, I hate designers who have their own agenda, their own style that they force onto a client. I think that's the wrong way to do design. Uh, you, me as a designer, I need to create something with the puzzle pieces that I have, which is what the client uh, is and I know that there's something in there that I need to bring out and something that uh, is true to them so that it's authentic and that will give a, a personal connection uh, for the artist to this brand or aesthetic. Thank you, Jesse. Now, I want to ask this question to the special guest, to answer the question. Golden Melody Award Award就金曲奖嘛，那对于这样一个其实是大家已经有很多既定印象的品牌，可是每一年你都一定会被要求说麻烦再给我一些创新的精神，有时候就是在这两者之间哦，会会有一些可能要经过很多的讨论，经过
金曲奖对我来讲，它是一个华人音乐里面最大的奖项。嗯，其实你要说它有什么品牌，呃，我觉得在二十五届之前它是没有品牌的。嗯，然后对我来讲，是你怎么去问一个对的问题。嗯，我觉得问对的问题很重要。那当然，其实呃，金曲奖，我第一个问题就会是，我们到底怎么去荣耀这些音乐人？嗯，然后我们。我可不可以再从金曲奖这边去连接一些台湾产业碰到的问题？嗯哼，然后台湾呃这些不同呃设计师，然后不同领域的设计师，我可不可以借由一个会面对大众的一个奖项去连接，去做串联？那我觉得这个其实是每一次每一次你们会看到一个不只是流行音乐奖项的一个制作的方法，所以在每一届大家都可以看到我们串联的方法是不一样的。然后我们放在里面的元素是不同的，啊、呃，从二五二六到我真的说我不要做了，就是让给新人做。我告诉川哥说，我真的让新人、让新的新一代的人去做。那当然，二九三十再回来是因为，呃，陈振川先生说这是他的最后一最后两届，所以我必须要回来这样子。所以对我来讲，我还是想 echo 回来刚刚 Jesse 跟 Sooner 讲的，嗯，呃，金曲奖对我来讲，其实或。很多时候你会碰到一个没有概念或没有想法的时候，我觉得对我们来讲，你要用不同的角度去切入去问问题。你可能问他的生活，你可能问他啊、呃、喜欢的电影，你可能问他喜欢的书。你用不同的方法去把问题问对，因为问题问对的时候，我们才会有一个对的设计的方式跟设计对的一个解决方法。所以金曲奖对我来讲，到底我们怎么去做？其实就是你要问什么问题，你要帮台湾音乐问什么问题，你要帮台湾的产业问什么问题，这样我们才可以在每一届的奖项里面 cover 到最多大家想要看的东西。其实问问题也是需要练习的，对不对？而且问多了才知道怎么问对。这一点我可能就会提醒大家，每一个你们今天愿意来参加这样子的 conference 的人，就是我相信你们都都想要改变一些事情。我觉得有个很根，就是很核心。的一个 mindset， 你们要保持的就是，很多时候大家会说，哦，我们我们想要有创意，我们想要有想法，我们要有不同的改变的方法。但到了制作的时候，又会说，哎，那你为什么没告诉我你想要什么？为什么你不告诉我你想想你想你想象的是什么？可是我觉得这是一个错误的问题，就是当你会提出这样的问题的时候，你就又回到手。的状态，而不是你想要当那个有想法的人，所以不要害怕提问。然后，因为没有在设计、在美、在体验、在任何的领域，它没有标准答案，它不是对跟错，它是在这些问题之中，你怎么找到一条路，可以顺着去 create 出一条旅程。嗯哼，我觉得你的问题要问的是这个，而不是标准答案，说哦，他喜欢绿色。或他喜欢就是很 shining 的东西，不是不是，你要问到的是他核心，例如说音乐或台湾音乐的领域，我们到底要问什么？嗯哼，好，接下来这个问题呢，跟 Sooner 有关，因为我们今天了解到 Sooner 的角色似乎都是在灯光这件事情上面，但他其实在灯光之外，他也有参与一些其他的设计跟制作。是不是史英苏呢？也跟大家来聊一下他在其他这个部分方面的参与，然后他怎么去转换这些角色？Ah,、oh, yeah.、Um, <laughs> wearing many hats.、Um, I, I don't know how to answer this one. I guess it depends on the artist I'm working with or the creative director I'm working with, and how you know. There are some creative directors that I've worked with that don't have as much of a clear vision of how they want to present the show、um, as Jesse does, and a lot of times I'm. Having to really dig deeper with them to figure out how we need to build this production and、um, interpret the、um, their way of thinking, their art form, and try to put it into the live space. So,、um, whereas there's other times where I work with Jesse or、um, there's another artist I'm about to start up with, where I'm simply the lighting designer, which I mean, I guess it's not a simple term. It's <laughs> still a massive, massive, massive undertaking. But、um, all the bones are already there, and I just need to light it properly.、Um, it's really just knowing what my role is going to be and 
um, a lot of times people are, are pretty open to uh, having me add in ideas of how you know I would think a show should flow. So for example, uh, Jesse's always left the table open for discussion. So if there's a moment in the show where he's like, well, we can do this, I can say, hey, what if we did this? And it's not always lighting. It could be like, well, yeah, the dancers are coming here, but what if we had them come from here instead? And, and he, he's not offended. He keeps the table open for discussion and, and allows these ideas to free flow. So in that, in that space, um, I sort of blend into the production design uh, side of things, but you know, still with the heavy, um, uh, heavily a lighting designer on the project. Um, it's just about knowing the process from the beginning and understanding where you fit into the, the pie and where you fit into the, the pieces of the puzzle, like what, what role you're supposed to fill to help everything move along, and when to step back, knowing when to step back and let everybody do what they need to do to make the show happen, and then you just add what you have to on top, I guess, is the best mm -hmm. way to answer. Sweet. 好，接下来 J T 要来问问，哎、欸，他们三位都可以答，好不好？我们先问一下 J C 哦，关于 J T， 就是他每次想到一些内容的时候，是怎么跟新科技连接上的？还是说他看到一些新的科技，诱发了他一些内容的创意？所以在内容跟新科技之间这个部分，他是跟大家来分享一下他的经验。That's a yeah, it's an interesting question, and it changes.、Um, I never want to force any technology on an artist、mm -hmm. uh, in any way. I think that the the idea should come first, and then I find the technology to to execute that first、uh, is much more important. For instance,、uh, the handler when I had these puppeteer string hands follow the the band members, that it was the the idea that came first, and then. I find technology to see if that's actually physical, physically possible. So,、uh, while I am inspired by new technologies, I guess it's it's never an agenda of mine that oh this is new I need to put it into a show.、Um, yeah, that's just not how I work. So, but it's nice to always to know what's out there. So it's on the the back burner I say、um, of the stove so that. Something's always cooking back there. 那 Jonathan 可以来回答这一题了。就是说，你应该也看到台湾现在有很多的音乐展也用一些新科技，也或者就是你接接到一些案子里也开始用这些新科技。你怎么是跟他们讨论这些使用的，不管是比例上的恰当、功能上的这个适合度、用与不用的这些标准？其实我跟那个 JC 的逻辑会一模一样，是就是。我觉得到底是你的创意到底是什么？ Mm -hmm. 呃，不是说哦 ，VR， 哦 ，MR，AR 什么， mm. 就是你一定要用，而是说哦，你看到了这些很多不同的科技，它会是你的武器， mm -hmm. 它会是你的内容，然后你要到合适的题目的时候，你才会把这些东西拿出来，而不是说哦，我现在 music concert 我一定要放 VR 或放任何新的一些科技的东西，我觉得它要一定是恰如其分扮演。帮我觉得音乐人说好故事、嗯，那个才是一个对的说故事方法。然后这里面有几个是做创意、做导演的角色，可以举个手，有吗？现场的朋友是做创意工作的导演工作的，导演 OK。好，我觉得 J C 就是其实应该你们每个人都可以去了解一下。我觉得 J C 他刚刚 present。啊、呃、的做法，其实这是这是我们 worldwide 就是 standard， 就是都是我们会这样子会去说故事的一个方法，就是你怎么帮大众想，大家去想象你要做的东西。然后像 Privets 刚刚我们看到的，其实大家应该知道我另外一个身份是 Digital Domain， 就是那时候在代理 Digital Domain，、嗯、所以呃 Privets 其实你也可以看到说 Lighting 怎么让大家去想象那个舞台的角色是什么，这些工具都是在帮助你跟。可能没有办法那么理解的人去沟通这件事情。那我觉得刚刚提到 Ready Play One， 我觉得很有趣的东西，大家可以去想象一下，就是其实在，在呃滴滴的技术，我们现在已经可以做到，就是啊，脸、呃、上不用打点，然后是 Real Time， 可以放给你看，嗯、去转换成另外一种虚拟角色。嗯、是，所以 Ready Ready Play One 那样的故事，其实在几年就要发生在整个世界上。嗯、所以，但回到刚刚的题目、嗯，我觉得还是创意。
你要说什么样的故事，那个才是优先。Story first， 嗯，故事先在前面。接下来这一题呢，要请苏仁来谈一谈，因为我们都知道现在演唱会的那个视觉影像面积越弄越大，有时候就是大到很巨大这样子。那灯光跟这样子的视觉要怎么样去？去搭配好，然后把这个内容做到，就是不彼此加分呢。A lot of it comes from the show direction.、Um, we like to make sure that we know what is going to be the more prominent element in a song ahead of time. So, if the video content is a pre-rendered piece of content that was made that's supposed to be a key element in the the storyline of the show. Then you take the lighting back quite a bit. Sometimes not even using any light in the overhead rig、uh, because it'll create beams in front of the screen, which can be very distracting to the audience.、Um, there's other moments where、um, maybe the video just goes away completely and it becomes just a light show. In that case, you know we go for it with the beams.、Um, also, color is a big deal. You know sometimes you can really. Muddy up a picture,、um, an overall picture of a stage. If you have way too many colors on stage, so if the content has a lot of colors and it's cycling through a lot of colors, there's faces, there's people, there's、um, roads, whatever that has a lot of uh, pic- uh, colors in it, then I tend to just choose one color for the song that would match everything, and then just stick to that color. That way, the content and the lighting don't get muddy, so you you don't see like a million different colors on screen.、Um, it's also the screen brightness.、Um, if the screen is too bright and you don't see the light beams, then you tend to turn the screen down so that you can get a nice balance when you need it. So there's many different ways to to balance、mm-hmm. that out. Hmm. 那我们就顺着这一题谈，就是孙的是不是也可以跟大家去聊一聊？就这个十年，这个 decade。这个整个灯光的设计，大概一个怎怎么的一个流变，一个转变的，跟我们大家聊一聊。哦、oh. <laughs> ， the future. Well, I mean, you know, Jesse pointed it out actually in, in one of the talk in one of our talks today. How like we are getting sick of light beams. It's like it's so funny. It's it's actually true. Um, I mean, I started. With power cans、uh, and a little two-seam、mm-hmm. preset board, where I was just you know m- changing, like I'd put up a scene and then have my faders down here, and I'd have a scene down here, and then、I'd、have to go quickly between the two scenes, you know. And that,、um, for me, that was a really good foundation because it taught me how to really think ahead、uh, when lighting, because I had to have that other th- scene set up ready to go.、Um, And just quickly switch between them, and then start on the next one.、Um, so, I know that these days, like it's so easy just to do whatever you need to do, right? That's the the console, the technology. It's just everything's at your fingertips.、Um, especially with previs, you can you can program an entire show in a studio around on the other side of the planet, and then just upload your file to someone, and they can put it into the console, and it'll work. It's crazy.、Um, if somebody had told me that I was doing that when I started on park hands, I would have told them they were insane.、Um, but I mean, I think the the future of lighting right now.、Um, I see a lot of creative directors、um, and lighting designers starting to trend towards not using beams, not using like the Sharpie beam or like a Unico or whatever. Like I see a lot of people just trying to use lighting as shapes. So physical shapes in in scenic or physical shapes above a stage,、uh, creating like different set pieces, but with lighting in them, so that you're actually seeing a shape or like a scene of light as opposed to just seeing the beams of light constantly going everywhere. I think that's sort of where the trend is going. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think okay. We, if I can jump in real quick too, I've noticed、uh, a lot of minimalism coming back. Into shows and、uh, where you can just have one light beam on a single artist in a simple background, nothing on stage, and that's becoming a a lot m- easier for people to digest than I'd say ten years ago, where it was about more, 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 and I think the the public can can handle less now. 
I've also mm. been trying to use video as light, right? So like a panel of video produces a lot of light. Mm. And it's also, if you just put a solid color on there, it's producing that solid color of light against you know a background. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be constantly moving texture in iMag, but it could just be a panel of light. Um, and it's a solid thing, right? It's an object, has an identity, whereas mm -hmm. content mm -hmm. tends to tell more of a story. So it's a nice little difference there. I see. Mm -hmm. 好,那接下来我们要进到下面这个领域了哦。就是，嗯，特别是这些年大家很喜欢也常听到的一个字眼，就叫做呃 immersive 沉浸式。哈，不管看舞台剧啦，甚至连一般的个策展，你都会看到这个字眼。这题来问 J C 好了，就是那如果在演唱会上也要创造这种所谓的 immersive 沉浸式的氛围，呃 ，J C 他会怎么去去把这个演唱会弄到这样的感觉出来？会会怎么做呢？ Well, there's. Uh, it depends on the context I'm working in. For a show, it can be limiting in some ways of uh, the venue restrictions and so forth. Uh, I've been recently really inspired by immersive theater uh, that I've seen and moments where the show is coming out uh, and engaging you in different ways on a personal level. Uh, some things that I tried to bring to simulation theory was, uh, you know, it occasionally maybe just hazmat people are running through the audience and uh, breaking up sort of your normal interaction. Uh, but I'm working on some things where there is that line of if you don't know if something is part of the show or not, um, people you're engaging with, maybe they're actors, maybe they're attendees. Uh, if anybody's seen this movie from the 90s, uh, The Game with Michael Douglas, um, I'm, I keep kind of going back to this of like not knowing where reality starts and stops. And so hopefully in the future with some shows that I'm working towards, uh, we'll see a lot more of that and things will become a bit more puzzling. Mm -hmm. 那接下来我们来跟张大神聊一下，就是冰叔，我们刚刚谈的 immersive 这一点。那像你要面对的就是客户，还有观众等等的，你是怎么样找到这些人彼此的共鸣点？然后你自己的 JL design 以后有可能往比如说流行音乐演唱会场域这个地方去做我们刚刚讲的这些事情吗？其实我觉得，呃，大大家千万不要背那种 buzzword。<笑>就是迷惑，就是 VR 的时候是 VR， 然后就是 immersive 的时候，大家现在都都在讲 immersive、yeah.。其实我觉得它其实就在讲一个 experience 跟 interactive、mm -hmm. 跟互动这件事情。Mm -hmm. 当你今天要所有的人来聆听一个故事的时候，你希望他在每一个角度里面怎么看到你的故事，怎么设计。然后我觉得是现在大家都在用科技，然后不同的方法在探讨。的一件事情，就像刚刚 J C 讲的，假使你今天，我们都知道说，哦、啊，看 music concert 或买电影、看电影，我们就是买了票、排队，整整场活动就开始了。可是，假使这些表演者都在你附近呢，会不会让你有一些不同的感受？所有的事情都是为了让我觉得观看者有更多。的可能性，你们可以去用不同的角度去看待这个故事而已。所以对我来讲，还是会回到来，回到你自己身上是，是你现在到底身上有什么多什么样的武器，去让你把故事说好？你要不要再给所有观看你的人多一点点的感受？就像用刚刚前面就是我做的几个作品来讲哈，例如说我们假设拿金曲奖的话，没有人说呃金曲奖需要包含社会议题。这样子的元素，没有人说金曲奖需要去提息每一个新时代的歌手到底是谁，没有人这样讲。可是我希望每一个看到的人都能拿到不同的东西，就是参与的音乐人、电视前面的观众、从业人员，我都希望他们能从不同的角度得到一些东西。我觉得这个是我对于体验互动的另外一种诠释方法，因为这有太多的角度去可以看待，但我们只要退过来。是，你可不可以让你的 T A、你的观看者拿到更多一点东西？那我觉得你就做到了一
做到了一些不一样的事情。只有的团队永远愿意做不一样的尝试。就是先让我们 focus 在眼前的金马奖，请大家关注。<笑>对，今年的金马奖<笑>很多的挑战，但、嗯、比较辛苦的一年会不错。对 ，OK， 好。呃，我今年在自己的节目做访问的时候，我很常问到了一题哦，为逐渐发现这一题出现在台湾的比较年轻一点的创作者身上，就是他们在创作音乐跟写一首歌或者是一张专辑的时候，他其实也同时在想。这些专辑的歌在表演上面的时候，需要长什么样子？可是我们就知道，过去很很少是这样子。他写歌歌就写完了，然后要要要要做演唱会的时候才开始想演唱会的东西。但是今天非常特别的，我们听到 Jesse 在讲 Muse 这个 Simulation Theory Tour 的时候，他几乎是在这个团体在创作这张专辑的同时，他也开始有了构想跟这个专辑有关的东西。这个在华语音乐圈里，我觉得是极少极少听到的一个样子了哦。我们大部分都是专辑做专辑的，呃，要开始做巡回演唱的时候，好，我们来想一个内容这样子。所以不晓得 Jesse 是不是可以跟我们分享一下，他觉得如果是一起同时出现，跟专辑做完之后再去想一个演唱会，这两种不同的方式，对于一个演唱会产业的生产制造过程，它带来的改变跟冲击是什么？ Um, well, since I'm trying to make a career out of <laughs> having a a larger、uh, influence with artists, I would definitely prefer the model I did with simulation theory. But I also think that、uh, potentially, because at least in North America, in Europe,、uh, artists are making most of their money now from touring or licensing to commercials and stuff. But Uh, not so much from the album sales, so、uh, the touring aspect in the show is becoming so much more important、mm -hmm. to their career,、uh, branding-wise as well as financially. And I think that uh, the uh, harmonization of the packaging and the branding rollout with the tour will、uh, start to coalesce a bit more. I definitely hear more management、uh, talking about wanting to create that identity、Whoa. for an artist. Yeah, it happens more and more, and how、um, an artist actually wants to create that identity from the packaging.、Um, I've always found it a challenge, a severe challenge, to get anybody to think about that as far ahead of time. I think Muse is definitely ahead of the curve in that, and hopefully Jesse can continue to make that happen <laughs> so that we can continue to do these great, amazing projects like this. So. <laughs> 讲了声，这边我可能也会讲一下，就是、嗯、是，呃，有看今年金曲奖的举手一下，也今年今年有看金曲奖，我很多都有看。好 ，OK， 嗯、呃，大家记得最佳音乐录影带是谁得的吗？有人记得吗？我知道了，《落日飞车》飛車对啊、呃，就是《落日飞车》自己导的，就是，所以我觉得大家可以，我们其实可以退后一点点看，现在整个其实不只是音乐产业，是所有的产业都在长这个样子，就是去中间化，嗯。那去中间化这件事情，其实每一个人都会在扮演多个角色。举例来讲，刚刚讲到唱片，就是这些音乐人们，他再也不是在靠唱片在赚钱，而是靠一些衍生出来，就是这些表演活动、演唱会这些相关的东西。其实我们看到会来越来越多这样子，大家在做这件事情，嗯、每一个人都是一个斜杠，就是哎、yep. 欸，你你自己在想象你的音乐，你自己在想象你的故事，你可以用什么样不同的方法，你在跟一些专业的人。去把那些东西再 polish、再 improve 下去，我觉得这个事情会持续的扩张上下去，因为每一个人都有自己独特的故事想讲。假使今天一个，我相信你们现在看到所有的音乐人，不管像是新时代的九零八八，任何新时代音乐，他们都对他们自己的在 social media 上面，在专辑的设计上面，在 music video 上面，在表演上面，在任何的曝光，他们都会有自己不同的想法。我觉得这个已经。不会是一个昙花一现的事情，这个会持续的在发生下去。Yeah. 其实今年特别是欧美的流行线上的歌手，呃，包括了 Billboard 杂志、Rolling Stone 杂志也大量的探讨，就是他们觉得
，他们看到了很多新一代，比如说像 Billy e i l i s h Post Malone， 其实他们几乎没有一种固定的风格，他们好像各种风格都可以，然后又把它揉出一种你刚刚讲的去中心化概念的风格东西出来，所以这是一件很有意思的事情。所有的东西都在一个急速、快速的质变当中，大量的成长着。那我们上一段因为也没有开放 Q&A， 所以我想我们后面这一段 Q&A 留长一点，让大家来提问哦。可以从刚刚我们看到的 Simulation Theory Two 里头任何一个细节、任何一个环节、任何一个技术，你听到你不懂、你想问的，或刚刚在这一段对话当中你想要延续的，都可以举手发问，好吗？来，我们现在开始。嘿，这边是，请说。Uh, I also have three questions. <laughs> wow. So, um, the first one is that, um, what is the motivation that driven you to create four virtual reality game before the show? Mm. Is that is that any other purpose or are there other reason why you put so much energy to create that the real games for it? And the second one is that um, I think the, the the singer Matt used the the technology called Bitcoin when he put a scope on his hand, so uh, people can see that there's a friend on the scope on the screen. I think that called virtual reality. So why don't you use the same technology for for that? That that's a moment Matt want to create that kind of um, hologram effect on his hand. So as a nerd, I think that's a same technology. So I was wondering why, 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 what's the reason why you choose the different technology to approach the same effect? And the third one is. Um, I really like the the smoke. Uh, both of you create for the image dragons. So would you mind to tell more deeper about the concept and the technology secret behind it? So uh, there will okay. be the three questions. Cool, I'll start off uh, with number one, the virtual reality games. That actually came to us as an opportunity from Microsoft who really wanted to push uh, their VR technology. And given this opportunity, and I, I thought with an arcade, this uh, sort of an 80s arcade feel, this would be a perfect opportunity. And the more we started talking with Microsoft, uh, the more this seemed like the, the perfect marriage for us, especially during this album cycle, as uh, we are dealing with uh, simulated realities in this album cycle. It made perfect sense. Uh, for your second question, um, using this sort of augmented AR, augmented reality aspect of the show, um, I'm not really sure how I could have pulled that off with different technology. That might be my own uh, naivete with certain technologies, but I needed for both the skull or the glove. Um, I needed a tracking device on that specific object. So wherever he was moving, um, my effect would follow precisely that angle. So um, at this moment, I, I guess there could have been, well, even with a, a 3D scanner that's like a Kinect camera in real time, um, it doesn't really give you that, that depth and its precision is not as tight as black tracks. That's the one technology I've found that can be quite precise. Um, if there's any other technologies you know of that can be tracked uh, in an arena in three dimensional space, uh, please let me know. I'll, I'll credit you. It'll be in the next tour. <laughs> um, Is it Microsoft uh, approach you or you approach Microsoft? Uh, Microsoft approached us. I see. Yeah. And for question three, Three about the smoke in mirrors. Do you want to talk about this a bit? Sure. Um, so we used a variety of smoke effects. We had, um, they're actually, uh, you can get them from any special effects company. There wasn't anything that was too uh, 
specific or like completely built for that tour. Uh, the smoke screen that we didn't end up using isn't very often used, but it's literally just, I think it's like a pipe or something and the smoke, like there's a, a bunch of little holes and the smoke comes through and it's supposed to create a sheet of smoke. Um, it's cooled down enough, right, so that the, the coolant like uh, allows the smoke to fall. So that's one thing, like anytime smoke is cooled down, it stays low. So um, unfortunately, when you're in different venues with different air conditioning and different temperatures, it rises up. Um, as far as cryo smoke is concerned, it typically only works in a humid environment. So if you're in a dry environment, you get just like a little puff instead of like a big uh, splash of smoke in the air. Um, but I mean, I believe on Smoke and Mirrors, we had just low fog. We had... Um, and then video content that was made in mm -hmm. Cinema 4D with Octane Render. Uh, there was fog machines strategically placed into positions on the stage. The, um, for example, there was like a cross grating inside the stage and we had smoke inside there so that we would, when we turned on that smoke, it would just come through that grating. So you've got kind of a cross pattern. Unfortunately, we can't control the smoke as much as we want to, but hopefully that's a technology that comes about soon as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That'd be great. Hmm. 这样子的团认为说他们有想这样的技术 发布的平台都变多了，所以没有谁只能做一件事情。你们都可以去多去想说，哦，我可以跟游戏串联吗？我可以跟任何新创产业去合作吗？我可以出一个我自己的饮料吗？我可以出一个专辑的唱片。为什
some rap acts. Whoa. What was it? Something 187? Um, uh, I, I have to look down, but names. I thought were amazing. We're and not fortunate enough to be as exposed to um, your music as much as we would like to be, I think is yeah. really the answer. But honestly, like anybody with a budget <laughs> 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 and the desire to make a spectacle. <laughs> yeah. And that uh, want to try something different and yeah. uh -huh. aren't very restrictive. Awesome. They want to take us through the beginning of creating the identity from the album. <laughs> yeah. Straight through to a film mm -hmm. or a comic book, if, if you please. <laughs> I'd really love to yeah, work with some artist that's just very violent and extreme, though. I think cool. <laughs> I need a, a challenge like that of just something mm -hmm. intense. <laughs> But by all means, if anybody knows, I mean, we'd love to come back over here at any time. Okay. Please. The more challenging, the better? Yeah, more challenging, okay. the better, and bring us back. Okay. <laughs> I really like your food. Uh, <laughs> Jonathan? A lot. <laughs> Actually, I really don't want to answer the question that I threw the stone to me. And then, uh... 我觉得其实演演唱会这这样的工作，其实它非常讲究，对我来讲是一个流程的设计。嗯，然后就是每一个环节的人都要知道自己在做什么。嗯哼，然后你才能成就好一场我好的演唱会。那我觉得，当然这也是毕竟整个团队的一个目标。那其实，在做完进去讲。这么多年以后，其实对，没有这么多年，对不起，四，就是六年以后，呃，我我其实对于任何的 artist， 这不是一个官方说法，就是我都有兴趣。假设你要做不一样的东西，嗯哼，我对于任何要做一样的东西，就千万不要找我，我也不想做。然后，呃，我觉得一定要从结构、整个说故事的方法都要能改变的人，然后这个才会是我们有兴趣做，或者说。啊、呃，他因为他没有预算，所以他有很大的空间，我也愿意。Oh. 因为对我来讲，反而就是你希望能说一些不一样的故事。嗯，假使你们想要说的是传统的故事，那就找你们传统合作的人就好了。嗯，了解。哎，刚刚这边好像有朋友举手，对不对？嗯，呃、谢谢各位今天分享这么多类型的巡演经验。那我想要请教一下苏呢，就是现在有越来越多配乐相关的表演，那尤其是像电影配乐的演出也逐渐逐渐走向娱乐化。然后像是《Hands the Emo》的巡演啊，或《Java 的冰与火之歌》音乐会等等都是。那也明白很多这类的表演，因为版权的问题，所以不是每一场都会搭配电影画面。所以更明白，就是像舞台设计的角色就很重要。所以想要了解一下，像 Sooner 跟 Java 的合作《冰与火之歌》音乐会的经验。那像是《冰与火之歌》本身就有故事的元素嘛，所以那又是一场以配乐为主的表演。那要如何将这么庞大的故事浓缩成一场秀？那做了哪一些灯光跟？视觉设计去融合这样的表演，谢谢。嗯、yeah, yeah. That was uh, hand, that was such a really incredible uh, <laughs> show to put together, uh, the Game of Thrones concert experience. Um, so for one thing, I'm a massive Game of Thrones fan. I read every book before this, before the TV show even came out. I well, I don't think all of them were out before the TV show came out, but I had watched every single episode. Um, so getting that call was was a really really exciting time for me, um, and essentially they asked our team to create an entire show from scratch, uh, right to the point of Ramin um, Jawadi, the composer, had given us the music, and it was in no particular order. It was just here's everything I've created for Game of Thrones, um, and I worked with another show director um, who is actually an illusionist, a magician. Um, to put together a show that was uh, it was immersive <laughs> mm. uh, for the audience, and it had to be HBO. It's HBO, so they, it needed to be larger than life, like crazy big. You know, you can't just put a puny show on a tiny stage for Game of Thrones. Um, copyright wise, you know, HBO was a partner in the show, um, so we were able to use whatever footage we wanted. We just had to be very specific about our asks. So we would uh, we worked with a content team that um, actually was in charge of just making sure that they had all the, the clips that they needed. We studied the footage of the show uh, for hours and hours and hours and hours, weeks, uh, and just made timestamps and saying, we want this clip to be in the show, this clip, blah, blah, blah. 
and then we would have to work with the HBO team, and they would deliver us the assets on these massive hard drives. Um, we got it got so intense with the hard drives and stuff. We actually had the CAD in the models of the dragons, which I can't believe I actually have that. Um, the models of the dragons that they used in the TV show uh, that we were able to use and manipulate to put into our content. It was insane. The one thing we couldn't do um, was we couldn't pull references that were not in the TV show. So for example, anything that George R. R. Martin wrote into his stories that never made it into the, the show, we couldn't use that. Um, and I was really bummed out about that because I wanted to plant Easter eggs in the show for anybody who had read the books, you know, specific things of um, that ended up after, like they ended up coming into the final seasons. There were a few Easter eggs that actually came into the final season. So now I'm thinking maybe HBO didn't want us to use them because they hadn't written those seasons yet, but they knew where they were going. Um, yeah, that was a really fun show to put together. Like one of the most difficult parts was when you're watching a TV show, you uh, especially that one, there's so many characters and you're jumping between scenes. Like you've got the King's Landing scene and then it jumps right to Winterfell with the Starks and then it jumps straight to the Night Walkers. And then and we, in order to tell the story in a live setting, we needed to make it a little bit more linear. So we blocked out the characters and the scenes in a way that was still um, a linear timeline that matched the storyline of, of what had been produced in the show, but blocked out those moments so that you would have like a seven to 10 minute block of just the Winterfell scenes on stage, but it still worked in the timeline of the show. It was a really, really difficult thing to do to get those timelines together. Um, also, the elements of like the co I could talk about this for hours. Are you sure you want to go down this road? <laughs> no. <laughs> Only a few minutes now. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's it was a lengthy process. We worked on that show for a year, uh, start to finish, from concept to reality, and it it was insane. Uh, the all the elements and how they came together. You know, the snow coming down on the screen around the orchestra matched with uh, snow machines in the air and the timing of that, or like getting the lead violinist off the stage to put on a new costume and then make their, her way up to the other stage to come up through a lift and then play inside a, what are those trees called, Dan? Help? Weirwood tree. We had a whole weirwood tree. Actually used the confetti, the leaf confetti idea. Sorry about that, I stole that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the leaves would fall from the tree and the confetti would come out. Collect your prize at there the merch stand. <laughs> Anyway, yes, that show was great. It was a fun one. Okay, we have just five minutes left. One more question, one last question. Do you have any friends who have a chance? Here, this one. It's the last one. Come on, please. I want to ask two questions. The first one is, you today mentioned a lot of cross-cultural alliances. I want to ask, what do you think about the space space and the space space and the space 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 space? 在演唱会的比例是怎么分配的？然后近期来演唱会设计是不是就是靠动态媒体会比较多？然后第二题要私信问一下 J C 设计师，就是从早上的演讲有提到过，他是有从事过室内设计的。然后想要问 J C 设计师，就是室内设计跟舞台设计一样，都是在玩空间，在玩灯光。那想要请问，就是这两者对于设计师的看法，就是不管是。设计上，或是刚开始的，就是在想发想的时候，是有什么想法的吗 ？J C， 呃 ，Who is question one for？ 你第一题想问哪一位？都都可以 ，Both。She asked both of you.、Oh, about the production design question? Yes.、Yeah. Um, knowing what elements are most important, um, it really is driven by um the storyline of the show. If it's a show that doesn't necessarily have a lot of spectacle in it, it's about um, telling a story through color and video content, which I think you asked about the video content side of things. Um, I mean, it's always driven by the storyline, like how what is, how do we want to portray the artist on the stage, and how d does each song represent itself, and how do we put that forward? Yeah, and I think uh, designing. 
both uh, the stage and directing the content, I'm able to uh, better understand how they will work together. I, in the past, I never thought I would create a, a stage that had a standard rectangle, rectangle screen uh, because it's so boring, but I think I tried to use it in a different way. This time, mixing live footage with real-time effects and video content that was pre-rendered all together. Um, I think I brought that in because I was tired of people looking off to the edge to watch uh, the band play, and I wanted them to look at the stage. Uh, so mixing those in, and I, I always try and, when I'm working with content, make sure that it's uh, considering the architecture of the, the shape of the screen it's very important to be conscious of that, whether um, I make content that has a lot of negative space, so uh, it feels like it's floating intentionally on the stage, or if the screen, screen is a particular shape that uh, I'm using that as part, of, uh, as part of the content, it's not just random. For, remind me what was question two, a part of that. Interior oh, design, yes. I actually see all of them as the same. Graphic design uses space as well. Um, there's, you know, you create something uh, in Z space in graphic design, whether you want it to feel more in the background uh, or the foreground. Uh, with interior design or a stage show, there's still a hierarchy and scale. Like, this is the first thing I want you to focus on, then this is the second and then this is the third bit of information. It's the same if I'm work creating a book or a poster, um, sort of the journey of the eye, whether it's in graphic design with a poster, um, I create, you know, sort of I want the first, your eyes to see this first and then kind of trail down this way. And then maybe there's a graphic element that's pulling your eye over to here and then down to here. Uh, it's the same way with a show and we use uh, lighting and other tricks to, uh, to focus your eyes on different things at different points in time. So I, I think that at the end of the day, sort of how Sooner was talking about earlier of like just an empty picture frame and you hold it up, um, that's kind of how I see everything that I, I do. Uh, even when designing a show, it's, you know, it's the frame and like how is the space working. And it is a little bit different with interior design and stage that there's so many different points of view where the audience is. Um, so yeah, that's something I'm, I'm still figuring out. Well,我会把这两个题目混在一起讲，就是呃，当你们在做任何设计的时候，你们一一定要记住那个对面的那个人是谁，谁是来看你作品的人，室内设计师可能是住的人，然后就是演唱会当然是这些歌迷，你要